first episode of the 2024 season of At Your Service with Haber and Martinez. I'm Haber. That's Martinez. And uh, we're here for today's show, which is episode number 82, entitled New Year, New Laws, What to Expect in Florida as of January 1st, 2024. So before we get into meat and potatoes, let me uh, indulge me for a moment. Let me just give you a little initial thoughts. Um, most of you are probably aware of how laws become laws. Uh, if you're not, then simply Google schoolhouse rock. <laughs> I'm just a bill. And that will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. So every year, many bills, which are proposed laws, are brought up by legislators, whether they're in the House of Representatives or in the Senate, whether it's on a state level or whether it's on a federal level, the process is pretty much the same. Some elected representative brings forth an idea, suggests it to the group and says, this ought to be a law. And then most of those ideas get scrapped in the moment. But the ones that don't, the small percentage goes to a committee for review. And then most of those that go to the committee get scrapped in committee. But those that don't go further into the full body for a vote. And then when they pass the vote, they have to go to the other house. So if they start in the Senate, they have to go to the House. If they start in the House, they have to go to the Senate. Either way, both the Senate and the House ultimately have to agree on one of these bills and then present it to the executive. On the state level, the governor. On the federal level, the president, who then has the opportunity to either sign it into law or to veto it. So that's the general overall process. And it would be really nice if it were a simple, smooth process and if people just passed laws that existed in perpetuity, but they don't. Laws are subject to change. They're subject to interpretation. Like everything else in life, there's a learning curve with laws. And the first one we're going to discuss today is a perfect example of just that. So the idea is every now and then they have to be tweaked. And that's what happened with our first law that we're going to discuss. But before we get there, again, let me recap how we're going to deal with today's show. Every year, many new laws kick in a lot of them on January 1st of a given year. Other times they kick in at other points of the year, depending on the law. But January 1st is always a good jumping off point. And since Ed and I uh, took a little bit of a hiatus for the holiday season, we figured we'd start this year by discussing a few of the cherry-picked laws that apply to our area of expertise, or as hashtag Haber PA likes to say, quote, the three C's. That is cops, courts, and constitutions. So there are a bevy of laws uh, that, that Governor DeSantis signed here in the state of Florida that we're not going to talk about. I'll give you a couple of for instances. Um, there was a law passed uh, regarding vote in, vote by mail ballots. Uh, there was a Florida resident friendlier, quote, campsite reservation rule act. There are additional back to school tax holidays, things like this that may be very important to any given person. And I don't mean to minimize their importance, but they're not relevant to us for right. purposes of this show. So the ones that we did highlight and that Ed and I are going to talk with you about over the next 25 minutes or so uh, are significant changes that were made to Florida's move over law. We'll talk about that one first. And that's the one I was addressing earlier where I said it's a prime example of a, a law that needed to be tweaked. Very good idea when it was initially uh, uh, passed, but they didn't think of everything. And of course, now the time has passed. They've had other opportunities to amend it, revisit it, expand it, change it, modify it, amend it, what have you. Um, there is a new Florida law that is the first in existence in the state of Florida. I don't know if it exists anywhere else or not but it's called the Protect Our Loved Ones Act. We will talk about that. Uh, every state that I know of and the federal government has what is affectionately referred to as a hate crime law. Florida has one. It's called Crimes, Evidence, and Prejudice. Uh, there was a, a, a significant amendment to that law, which we'll address. There was some interesting uh, change made to child protective service investigations, but only as regards seven specified counties in the state of Florida, which is interesting. Ed and I will talk about that a little bit, uh, although we won't delve too deeply into the meat and potatoes because we don't really give a crap what happens at DCF. That's dependency court stuff that he and I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, and neither would Kostrowski, who, by the way, is a 10-foot pole. Um, the final one that Ed and I will discuss is creation of, quote, 
lactation spaces in municipal courthouses. When we finish with that discussion, we're going to tackle the biggie. So the second half of this show, we're bifurcating the show. The second half of the show will deal exclusively with the new unified bail schedule that was passed by the Florida Supreme Court at the behest of the Florida legislature and Governor DeSantis, which also expanded mandatory pretrial detention laws. And since that is such a big, hot topic, and because it is so uh, intricate and involved, we are privileged to have our uh, limited residential surety slash bonds person uh, extraordinaire, Russ Walters of the bail bond firm, who will join us for the second portion of the show so that we can get into the weeds a little bit, not only with, with what it means as a matter of law, but practical realities for purposes of your lawyer, yourself, and your bondsman. Because as we all know or should know, if you get arrested, yeah, they always say call your lawyer. But the truth is, it's not your lawyer who's going to be posting bond for you. It's your bondsman. So yes, you do want to talk to your lawyer. But if you call me, I'm going to be three-waying the bondsman in the call because there's very little for me to do, except now that we have these certain changes that were made to the previous bond schedule prior to January 1st, there are some reasons that you're going to possibly need to talk to your lawyer. And we're going to, again, get into the weeds on that. So I apologize for taking so long to preview the show. Ed, how are you? Happy holidays. Welcome back. Oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Those long holidays, it gets harder and harder to come back to work. Oh, I felt so good. Let's let's talk. We need another COVID lockdown. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, let's talk, I need a COVID lockdown, but let's, society certainly does not need another one. Let's talk a little bit about the, the move over law. The, the move over law, basically, you may not know it by name, but, but basically the, the move over law was passed in Florida as a way to protect uh, emergency first responders. So if a ambulance or a fire truck or a police vehicle uh, is coming up behind you while you're driving, you need to pull over. Okay. Or if a police vehicle or a fire truck is on the side of the road with their sirens and lights on and they're engaged in their duty, you need to move over a lane so that you don't run the risk of accidentally hitting the vehicle or clipping an officer. Or if you can't or, or a responder. Or if you can't move over, you have to slow down. I just don't remember this. Right, 20, 20 miles an hour. 20? Yeah. Well, so here's, so here's it's, the thing, Mike. Before hang on one sec. It's so the idea of the law is it's it's designed to protect first responders so that Florida people driving in Florida, whether they're Florida drivers or tourists, we are the ass hat driver capital of the world, especially during the winter months. But it's designed to protect these very important people who are doing a very important job while right. they're doing their job. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off, Ed. No, no, no. It's okay. I'm just saying. It's um, people don't do it as we speak now for police officers or first responders. I don't think a lot of people out there who are driving in, in Florida, at least in Dade County and Broward, don't realize they have to move over or slow down. I've seen people fly right by a cop standing on the well, side. Of the you know, we talked about this back in July because, again, sometimes laws take effect whenever they're set to take effect. And we had several that took effect in July of this year. And you and I did a show on that. Yeah. One of the laws that you and I talked about was the law that allowed individual school districts to put traffic cameras on their buses so that when people blow by the school bus, when it's got its stop sign out and they're supposed to be stopping, they're literally caught on camera and you get their license plate. Right. I, I think law enforcement should definitely law enforcement and first responders should consider doing that because it's a very dangerous. They're putting themselves out there to help others. And, you know, whether you, whether you have a problem with law enforcement or not, I don't see anybody who could have a problem with first responders, emergency, you know, uh, uh, EMTs or, or um, paramedics. I think they should, and they should be able to give you a ticket like they do a red light camera. If you weren't driving too bad, you don't let your car, don't loan your car to people who don't know the laws because so, people get killed all the well, time. That's exactly what, the law is designed to do. So what's new as of January 1st? How did the law change? The biggest changes to the law are that they expanded it beyond just first responders. So now the law also applies to utility workers. So whether it's a gas company, the electric company, telephone companies, any utility vehicle that's on the side of the road or 
or engaged in its operations is also subject to the same move over law. It expanded it to garbage and sanitation vehicles as well. And it expanded it to private vehicles that are exhibiting some sign of distress. So if you are a car that's on the side of I-95, let's say, for example, you're on the shoulder of the highway and you've got your hazards on, the same move over law now applies to you as a private citizen as it did apply to just previously first responders. So these are common sense things you would think, right? If a vehicle is on the side of the road and you're cruising up the turnpike at 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, whatever, and you're in the right lane of traffic and there's a car broken down on the shoulder, the law now says you need to either slow your ass down or get over to the left because you're running the same risk of and, citation. And, and I don't know about you, Mike, but in the past, when I've had, to, I've, I have on occasion had to change a tire on the driver's side of my vehicle on the highway. Scariest, scariest it, thing ever. It's terrifying because nobody slows down and nobody moves over. And they're flying by you at 70, 80 miles an hour. If they're just eating crap for one second and they deviate just a little bit, they could kill somebody. I, I have right now, I have a, a, a DUI serious bodily injury case where my client was driving on the road. It was a highway and he was traveling in a, in a, in a, the right lane and there was a vehicle on the side of the road in that exact position it had a flat tire there was an individual off the sh on the shoulder of the road out of lanes of traffic he was working on his car and unfortunately my client struck the vehicle you know he he, he crept out of his lane and, and physically hit this parked vehicle and of course the vehicle swung into the individual and the individual got injured too so you know again these things happen whether it's because it's impairment, distraction, and what you could blow out a tire. I mean, anything could happen. I was, gonna, I was just going to tell you, even if you're focused, what if you blow out a tire right before you pass by that? Or, or I'll tell you what, this has happened to me in the past, where I've been minding my own business, driving in my lane of traffic, doing the speed limit, and somebody in front of me hits debris in the road that their tire flings. I had that occur to me once where it hit my windshield. And I'm just driving my own business. All of a sudden, my windshield got shattered. So, you know, I mean, it's, it, things happen. The point is, this is designed to protect innocent bystanders as opposed to just law enforcement and or other first responders. So I think that this is a, a great example of a tweak in the law that was appropriate, responsible, and, uh, and will benefit everybody. As we move on, the biggest point we can make on this law is there should be absolutely no reason why you get a ticket for this law. Move over. Oh, actually, there is one more point to make, and that is you just said it, but I want to highlight it. It is a ticket. This is not a criminal violation. If you do get cited for failing to abide by the move over law, it's a non-criminal traffic infraction, just like speeding or running a red light. It's dangerous, obviously, but it's not a criminal act. You will not be charged with a crime. You could go to the ticket clinic for that. Okay. Um, okay. So the next one we want to talk about is the Protect Our Loved Ones Act. And with regards to this, um, I don't know if any other state has this or not, but it's a really interesting law. And I think the idea behind it is um, is very responsible and heartfelt. It's kind of a, a bridge the gap between defund the police and chain and train the police. Right. I thought the same exact thing. So what what we did here in Florida was we created a, a law that creates a registry. It's called the Disabilities Registry, Persons with Disabilities. And it is a complete opt-in, opt-out, voluntary registry. So it's not like you get put on a list and you can't get it. It's not like the terror watch list. This is different. This is for people who have either developmental or mental or physiological or psychological disabilities that are bona fide, that can be proven, and that either themselves want to be placed on this list or their caretakers, be it because you're a minor and it's your parent and your parent is looking out for you, or you're an incapacitated person and you have a guardian and the guardian is looking out for you. And the idea is that it allows law enforcement agencies, municipal, local law enforcement agencies, to create these dis persons with disabilities databases so that they can maintain voluntary reporting information on their own citizenry. So let's say, for example, I have autism or I have a child with autism. 
I can tell my local North Miami or Miami Dade County Police Department, hey, this is my name. This is my son's name. I want you guys to be aware. This is his date of birth. This is his condition. Now, by the way, you can't just put yourself on or somebody else on. It has to be proven. You have to be able to document it. And it has to be verified by either a, a medical doctor or a psychologist. The, the statute lays out the criteria. And so it's not hodgepodge nonsense. This is legitimate and it's required to be legitimate. And the idea behind it, which I want to read to you because I don't want to paraphrase. But the idea behind it is, this is a direct quote. The information provided to law enforcement officers under the bill may assist officers in their official duties by preparing them to respectfully and appropriately interact with an individual enrolled in the registry who has a relevant disability or condition. So what does this do? Well, before you get going, just yep. make everybody, you forgot one tiny piece, I think they should just know a pad. Go ahead. It is also limited just to law enforcement. Law enforcement will not disseminate this to anyone nor can anyone have access to it. It's simply for law enforcement. That's law partially true. So, yes, it is not a public record. I was going to get to that, but thank you. Okay. And, yes, it is limited to law enforcement, but law enforcement can and is actually expected to share this information with other law enforcement agencies. Oh, right. It's other specifically designed so that there is communication between right. agencies because oftentimes – you have somebody in the city of Miami who winds up arrested or in trouble or engaged in a police citizen encounter somewhere else in the state of Florida. So the idea is no matter where you are within the boundaries of the state of Florida, if you meet the criterion and if you have opted in, then theoretically, at least, the police will be made aware of this. Now, functionally, who knows? It's just right. part of January 1st. My, my, my point was that it's limited to law enforcement. Right. Law so, enforcement will share it among themselves. But- you know, it's not like you can go down to the police station and ask somebody, hey, my neighbor, Michael Haber, right. a weirdo. No, this is not, this is not yeah. like the sex offender registry right. where people can go online and look it up and see that you're a registered sex offender. This is, a, this is an opt-in private law enforcement database, which is specifically designed to, to reduce the odds or to increase the odds, to reduce the odds of a negative interaction and to increase the odds that officers will be able to deal with this. Because, for example, let's let's say that they know that this individual suffers from uh, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Maybe they do want to bring a licensed therapist with them to that interaction. Or maybe they just need to be armed with that information so they don't misinterpret signals or cues. So right. th this, this is really, a, I think, a very sensible, responsible... Uh, way to cope with a situation as opposed to taking a radical approach like police shouldn't be responding to any calls, just send social workers, which we all, I think anybody who's got a rational brain knows is, is beyond or, absurd and borderline insane. Or the other thing, because this again seems to have been a mainly, I think we're mainly now Republican in the, in the Senate and in the House of Florida. And I know we've got a Republican uh, governor, right? But this also addresses the uh, the opposite extreme, right? The, the super right who would say, screw it. If you've got a disability, it doesn't mean you can break the law. Well, that's also a little harsh because when people have disability, whether it be psychological or physiological, you know, if you've got Alzheimer's, you might break the law and not even know what the hell you're doing. And so the officer would come, doesn't know somebody has Alzheimer's and may take an aggressive tack when all they've got to do is take it easy with this person and understand they don't even know what they're doing. Or like you said, bipolar disorder, who's in the middle of an episode, they're having a psychotic break. The officer shows up and rather than think he's an asshole, which is what you might think if they don't have a mental disorder, you realize, oh, no, he's just having a psychotic break. We've got to get him under control and then we can deal with the issue. So. I think it's great. And I think I love that politics was left out of this. And everybody, I, I hope, up there in Tallahassee decided we've got to find a way to find the happy medium. There's a lot of encounters with law enforcement that gets escalated simply because law enforcement doesn't know what's happening. Even if they had training, they may not know that that person suffers from something. And it gets escalated when it could have very easily been de-escalated had the officer simply known in advance. So I like it a lot. Exactly. Just I, I think this is, I, I think it's just a very sensible, really responsible, yeah. sensible thing. And, and, you know, there's a lot of 
Well, I guess there's no point in beating, browbeating on it anymore. And the good thing is you can opt in and you can opt out. So you can opt right. in. So anybody at any point, out, opt out. At any, at any point, you're able to opt out. And at any point, you're able to opt in. You just have to be able to prove that it's bona fide. And it's got to be obviously verified. All right. So, so uh, let's my, on. my wife calling me a crazy bastard doesn't qualify. In your case, absolutely it does. <laughs> Knowing you and your wife. Let's uh let's get on to our next one. So Florida, like like many states in the federal government, has what is affectionately referred to as a hates crime hates hate crimes act. The actual the actual language of the act is uh uh crimes evidencing prejudice or evidencing prejudice while committing certain offenses. So it's not there's no such thing as a as a a, a, an offense called hate crime. You committed a hate crime, that's the crime. No. Hate crimes, the statute is a reclassification statute. And what it does is it enhances whatever crime it is that you commit or are accused of committing, it enhances it a degree. And thus your exposure gets enhanced in terms of criminal penalties because the crime was committed evidencing prejudice. Right. So if I take a swing at Martinez and it's a and I clock him and it's a battery, that's a first degree misdemeanor. Assuming there's no great bodily harm, it's a first degree misdemeanor. But if while doing it, I make a racial slur or I make one of the proscribed slurs, which we will get into in a moment, then that first degree misdemeanor battery becomes a third degree felony battery because it was done evidencing prejudice. So prior to January 1st of this year, the basis upon which a crime could be enhanced in the state of Florida as a hate crime were if during the commission of the felony or misdemeanor, there was evidence of prejudice based upon race, color, ancestry, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, or homeless status or advanced age of the victim. So those were the are the delineated factors that constitute a, a potential enhancement under Florida's hate crime statute. As of January 1st, Governor De the, the bicameral Congress proposed and Governor DeSantis agreed and signed into law an amendment that added a new classification. And the new classification, in addition to all of those which still exist, is crimes that include acts of prejudice based on, quote, gender or gender identity of any person. So this is not a political show. But for those of you who say that Governor DeSantis does not care about LBGTQ or identities or pronouns or whatever, he didn't veto this bill. He signed it into law. Could have, could, have, could have taken a hatchet to it or a blowtorch, chose not to. Anyhow, the point is, I personally, as a private citizen, may or may not agree with your gender identity, but I, if I commit a crime and I invoke some sort of hatred or prejudice as to your gender identity, I have now enhanced my offense by a degree just because of my language. And let's, let's face it. I mean, look, if you look, in my opinion, and again, this is not a political show. But laws are based around, and they revolve around, our U.S. Constitution. And I do love our U.S. Constitution, having studied international relations and history, just like you, Michael. Our Constitution, if you look at other countries, it's just amazing what they thought of and how they almost anticipated every scenario that's happened several hundred years later. <clears throat> when we look at that, right, the issue becomes, and again, I don't want to get too political. I'm not agreeing with one or the other. But the issue becomes that a lot of people lose sight of something. Your constitutional rights begin where mine end or vice versa, which means you have every right to say that you feel like another gender. You have every right to say you feel like a cat. That's fine. The problem becomes when somebody tries to do something to you because you're, you're taking you know, uh, your, your, your rights, because you're taking advantage of your rights. So this, I think, resolves the problem. Michael and I do not have to agree with somebody that was born as a male who now thinks they're a female, or we do have to agree. It doesn't matter. That doesn't really matter because 
under the Constitution, Michael and I have every right, you have every right, so does the person who's transgender. Where the problem comes is when somebody tries to force that transgender to not live like a transgender, to not live the way they want to live. That's where the problem becomes. So I think this law addresses it. You cannot cause, you can't go and attack people just because you disagree with what they say. Now, in this case, we're, to, we're talking about a physical attack. But let's stop and think from all sides, from both sides of this argument. When you attack somebody verbally just because they disagree with you, it's the same thing. Don't attack anybody just because they disagree with you. Simple. So I love this law, and I love that Ron DeSantis did this. I think it hopefully will go a little bit ways because I don't like people being accused of stuff they don't. I'm not endorsing Ron DeSantis. I just don't like when people accuse people of things that they're not guilty of. Agree to disagree without taking a swing. Correct. Let's hit our <laughs> let's hit our second to last one, and this one's going to be quick because I I just I only put it in here because I found it curious, and I thought you and I might have an interesting discussion about the why of it since i can't I, look you know this thing was like a 60 page bill and it's so goddamn boring i can tell you right now i would never run for public office just because if i had to read these things i would be like uh you know oh, you have your i would be out of my mind there, there would be a mass shooting in the, in, your, in the capital your, your aides read them this is horrible um anyhow what i've discerned from this is this the the the, the law that took effect as of january 1st it affects only seven specific counties in the state of Florida. I think we have 68, 67, or 68 counties in Florida. This law only applies to seven of them. And it's absurd. And, and the why of it, you and I can talk about because I don't really know the why of it. I have a guess, but, but I'm not clear. I'm shocked that these counties were actually trying to conduct the investigation instead of letting these... Well, let, let me tell the folks what it is. So... This deals with specific, just the one category of child protective services investigations. Those are generally done by DCF, by the Department of Children and Families. But a lot of times these calls go into the local sheriff's office and the sheriff will have deputies that conduct certain aspects of the investigation. Maybe they bring DCF in, maybe they don't, maybe they conduct their own thing, maybe they do it jointly, what have you. Anyhow, for whatever reasons, the Florida Senate and House and Governor DeSantis all agreed that Hillsborough County, Manatee County, Pasco County, Pinellas County, Broward County, the 954, Seminole County, and Walton County no longer can conduct any CPI investigations. They have stripped those sheriff's departments of any ability or right to work in this particular arena. They have ordered that as of December 31st, 2023, every case that they had had to be handed over to the state. And if they wanted, they, they added a lot of very interesting provisions in here. Just a couple I want to highlight. One is that they said that any deputy sheriff from any of those counties who was doing that function for that office can laterally transfer and become a state employee with DCF if they wish. They, they are guaranteed no pay decrease. They are guaranteed no uh, issue with regards to their pension, which will continue. They are guaranteed that any leave that they had accrued is obligated to be honored by the state. They made it very easy for these individual deputies to leave those jurisdictions, which I find absolutely fascinating. It, the only thing I can imagine is that there must have been such horrible, deplorable action by these particular sheriff's offices that they were compelled to strip them of this ability to conduct this function. Well, I think, you know, if you look at here in Dade County, a lot of times there's an, not all the time, but a lot of times there's an overlap of a criminal investigation as well as a, as a, um, a um, DCF investigation, right? Um, a, a parent or a step parent or. Boy. Right. But these are, these are specifically geared towards, child protective investigations under chapter 39 those are non-criminal those are basically dependency cases that's what i was getting at i understand that there's an overlap but if there's no overlap i don't think law enforcement should be involved i think if there's not a criminal act they need to let dcf handle it and the courts okay now, but here's but here here's the here's the problem with that and i understand and respect it i'm not disagreeing with you but apparently 61 other counties in the state of Florida are competent to do this. Right. I, I don't understand. 
No, well, I think the other counties that do it do allow C, uh, uh, DCF to handle it. That's the problem. I think the other counties are letting DCF handle it. Oh, I, I don't. Well, again, I don't know. I can't explain That's the it. why of this. This is just one of those inexplicable. Yeah, I think you know, know. that those counties thought that they knew better and just weren't letting um, DCF handle it, and now they're letting DCF. They're going to have to let DCF handle it. All right. So we have one more. Excuse me for one second. I just want to see if uh, Russ is about to log on. Well, when he logs on, Michael, we'll. Uh... Yeah, no, no, no. I just want to make no, sure that he's that he's that he's in the queue. All right. So the last one that you and I are going to talk about is uh, a new law. The statute is Florida Statute twenty nine point twenty four. Uh, this was from the 200, 2023 legislative session and became law January 1st of this year. As of January 1st of this year, quote, each county courthouse, each county courthouse must provide at least one dedicated lactation space outside of the confines of a restroom for members of the public to express breast milk or to breastfeed privately. The space must be, quote, hygienic, clean, sanitary, and conductive to maintaining and preventing disease and be shielded from public view. What do you think about that one, Ed? Uh, I don't have a problem with it. I just didn't realize there was such a big problem. Um, I, I didn't really, I mean, is there that many women or men, I guess, I don't know. I don't think men can lactate. Actually. Well, you know, the only, the yeah. only one I know of for sure is, um, the second spot. There's Russ. Hang on, Russ. We're, we're just finishing up on our last point and we're going to get right to you. Uh, Thanks. but you hit right in an appropriate time. Cause I was just about to mention, I don't know if you saw the movie or not, but the second Meet the Fockers movie, the one where they, they, the, the De Niro side of the family meets up with the Streisand Hoffman side. You guys know that movie, the second Meet the Fockers? Yeah, so De Niro had, uh, 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 he was guarding his grandson. Uh, he was serving as a guardian for his grandson at the time. I guess they couldn't sign the mother from the first movie. And he had a fake breast that he was breastfeeding the child with. So, you know, who knows? I, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really, but in the courthouse, I didn't realize it was such a big issue for breastfeeding in the courthouse. I, again, I'm not being facetious. I know it sounds like I'm being facetious. I'm making a joke of it. But I, I have you ever had a client, Mike? I've been doing this for 23 years. I've never had a client who says, oh, I can't go to court today because I got to breastfeed my kid. Well, I think the point is that there are people who do go to court that have to breastfeed their yeah, kid. I don't have a problem they're stuck doing it in front of everybody or they have to go into a bathroom where they're exposed to people. First of all, I would rather be sentenced to time in the Dade County Jail or the Florida prison system than use the public bathroom in the Richard E. Gerstein Justice Building. So, you know. Correct. There's only a handful there done that. Full of bathrooms in that building that all of us know which ones they are to use. What was that, Russ? Been there, done that. Yeah. No, no so, thank you. Let's, yeah. let's hop off lactation now that we've been joined by Bail Bondsman Limited Residential Surety Extraordinaire, Russ Walters, who just popped off our screen. You just lost as, him. Okay. As, soon as, I, as soon as I introduced him. As soon as you opened your mouth, he's like, I don't want to, hear, I don't want to deal with Amor. Yeah, yeah, I, wonder, I wonder if that was a cause and effect thing. It was a person. But it looked like he was driving in his car. Yeah, which you really shouldn't be driving. Yeah, by. God willing, there was no accident here. But we're well. Let's get there. There he is, Russ. Don't get into a car accident, my friend. Mike, I lost you. I lost. The that's, that's that's two. If we get three strikes, he may be out. Well, let, let's let's introduce what we were going to talk to Russ about. Anyhow, um, the the Florida Legislature directed the Florida Supreme Court to create a uniform bond schedule that would serve the entire state. The uniform bond schedule is traditionally prior to this has been a county by county or circuit by circuit experiment. In other words, just as each of the 50 states in the United States of America are entitled to have their own laws and their own rules independent, 
so too are each of the counties in the state of Florida allowed to have certain of their own rules independent. There was no overriding uniform rule regarding bond amount. There are plenty of uniform rules regarding bond. Right. You know, conditions of bond, when bond is appropriate, when bond is not appropriate, factors that the judge must consider, factors that the court can consider. All of these things apply statewide, but great discretion was given to each area. So, for instance, Dade and Broward have traditionally had radically different bond schedules, with Broward traditionally being far lower than Dade. For example, in Dade County, the standard bond for any third degree felony, and again, this is all subject to change. We're just talking about standards. Every individual case was and still is subject to scrutiny by the judge. So there is always the ability for a judge to make a, a calculus in a given case regarding unique facts and circumstances and a unique defendant. But there were overriding principles and guidelines. And so the, the standard presumptive bond for a third degree felony in Miami-Dade County was always $5,000. Go right across the county line to Broward and historically the standard presumptive bond for a, uh, a third degree felony in Broward was $1,000. So it was a significantly lower bond. What the Supreme Court did by order of the legislature was create a standardized bond schedule. But the things that are, there's a lot to this. There's a lot of meat and potatoes, which is why I was hoping Russ was going to be able to join us. Maybe he'll pop back, maybe he won't. But the things that I want to start with are the first words out of the administrative order from the Supreme Court, which say this bond schedule only applies at the point where somebody is booked into the jail and has not yet been taken before a judge. Anybody arrested in the state of Florida that's booked into a jail either posts bond or if they do not post bond, must be taken up, oh, Russ back. There you go, Mike. Man, I've struggled to get back on. Thanks, I'm sorry, buddy. No worries. I'm just explaining right now the initial aspect of what the Florida bond schedule is designed okay. to do. And I'm saying that it only applies to that period of time between an arrest and somebody being taken to an initial appearance. So Correct. if for people who are trying to bond out before they go to initial appearance, this new statewide standard applies, but it has no bearing on anything that occurred after initial appearance. So in other words, if you want to move to modify or amend or alter any condition of pretrial release, or if you want to challenge pretrial an order of pretrial detention, this does not affect that. That is a separate process. The second thing that I want to point out is that this schedule, and this is a direct quote from the Supreme Court, this uniform statewide bond schedule shall not bind a judge in an individual case who is conducting a first appearance hearing or a bail determination. So again, this is strictly a minimum standard for people who are trying to bond out right after being booked into the jail and without having to wait however long it takes within a 24 hour period to get in front of a judge. Before I go any further, let me reintroduce or introduce Russ Walters. Russ was with us once before on a bail show. Um, he's been writing bonds in, in the state of Florida uh, almost as long as I've been alive, uh, about 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Russ? Correct. 54 years. He is the principal of the bail bond firm. Uh, you can find his information on all of our social media. We've linked to it. Um, I am very comfortable in saying that Russ has probably, and this is not to say that he's forgotten anything. But he has probably forgotten more about Bond than Ed, I, and pretty much every judge, every other lawyer in this county put together ever knew. Um, he, Russ is pretty much the Encyclopedia Britannica or the Google of, of Bond issues. When you have a question as a lawyer, you call Russ Walters. You don't Google it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us and taking the time out. I appreciate it. But remember, I I really appreciate safety, it. safety hey, first. Yeah, yeah. First, keep your eyes, but you don't need to look at us. Keep your eyes on the road. Keep your eyes I'm on the road. Trying. I'm trying. I was trying to sign back on. I had you guys on the screen. I watched your lips move and couldn't hear you. I was on the screen. You couldn't see me. It was weird. Hey, listen. You, so I know you guys are touching base on the uh, the new the new statute that took effect January one. 
Give us your thoughts and your impressions, Russ. Uh, it's just such a cluster. It's amazing what's happened. Like the the basically the the statewide the, the statute says that any first and second degree felony has to see a judge first. They can't automatically bond out. And then when they go to court, it's at the judge's discretion. So what we've been seeing lately a lot of is the judges are given bonds. This is prior to January one in preparation for the new law that's about to take effect. The judges have been given releasing people on one dollar bonds, ROR. They're trying to find any mechanism where they can release somebody without having to set a bond. And then when the statute took effect, the whole system, for some reason, all of a sudden, I think on the third of January, uh, the chief judge, Judge Safey, issued an administrative order, uh, I guess, codifying or or making the, the statement that the new law takes place now. And then all of a sudden, corrections took the position that everybody, it doesn't matter what you're charged with, has to go to a first appearance. And it kind of threw the whole system upside down. Nobody understood why. And now all of a sudden, that's what they're in, in the process of doing. So, so if I can if I can chime in on that for a second, you know, this is a great example of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. Yeah. Um, there is no reason for this kind of confusion. OK, I, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. You don't even need to be a lawyer to read this very simple, very, simple. very simple order and understand it for what it is. Oh, I think we lost Russ again. You don't need to be a genius or a lawyer to figure out what this thing means. Yet, corrections could not figure out what this means. Um, and, and by the way, look, I have a great respect for individual corrections officers, as I know you do, Ed. We know many of them. We've known many of them over the years. But as an agency, they adopt some stupid-ass policies and some stupid-ass positions. Can I, can I clarify? It's not stupid-ass. It is lazy-ass. The bureaucracy that controls or the, the powers that be that control the bureaucracy of corrections is mainly out of lazy. We have a saying in Spanish, la ley del menor esfuerzo, the law of the least amount of effort. They subscribe to that law. They don't want to read. I can guarantee you, Michael, that the reason this happened is because the powers that be didn't want to read. Well, I want to throw this out there, and I, and I don't mind shaming them publicly, because I, I sent a request asking somebody from corrections. This had nothing to do with the bail issue. This was well before this new uniform law I uh, was passed. But I sent them a request to come on this show. I wanted somebody from corrections to come on. I wanted them to be able to talk directly to the community and explain how they do what they do, as opposed to us talking about it. You know, I wasn't looking to set them up or trash them. I was actually wanted to give them a forum because the individual, the individual officers that we know that we interact with, man, these are hardworking, dedicated people who take their jobs seriously. And they're just as frustrated as we are. Because they right. have control. And, and so Miami-Dade County Corrections slammed the door on me. They said, absolutely not. We were not coming on your show. By the way, it's a six-page administrative order. Seven. Well, the last page is, is signatures. Yeah. No, well, and it, it's six page double spaced right. with large fonts. So, I mean, if it were really, it's probably a two page and, document. And if I may, page one, you probably don't need to read much of it because it basically says effective January 1st of 2024, the Supreme Court hereby uniforms applies because of a policy where they didn't need to read all that. They could have just gone straight to page two. And started reading from page two to about page five. That's it. Well, let me let me go through. Excuse me. Let me go through a couple of bullet points, and and then we can circle back and 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 you know pick it apart. Okay, so, so okay, yeah. Jim, we'll so circle. here's so here's my here's my nutshell bullet point analysis. The new uniform statewide applies only before first appearance, only before a bond hearing. And it affects pretrial detention before an initial appearance. So in other words, certain people will be pretrial detained, certain will not. Um, it is specific to use the language, this quote, shall not bind a judge in an individual case. So it has no binding on any specific case. It's just a guideline standard. Um, Counties are free to raise the bond below the thresholds of the statewide uniform schedule, but they cannot go below it presumptively. However, it allows for the chief judge of any particular circuit 
to be able to apply to the Supreme Court for a variance. So allow me a moment to indulge me just, a, a, again, a non-political analogy to a political talking point. There are many people who feel that the minimum wage, the federal minimum wage should be raised to whatever number, $20 an hour, let's just say. The problem is that the federal minimum wage hits 50 different states, and each of those 50 states are, are differently situated. So a state like Idaho, for example, has very different needs and requirements and economies than, say, California, New York, or Florida, right? So a $20 minimum wage may be perfectly appropriate for a, you know, a big urban metropolis state or area, whereas it may be crippling to a more rural or less expansive urban area. So in this same light, there are counties in the state of Florida that are in radically different places. You have the functional equivalent of an Idaho in certain parts of Florida, as you have the functional equivalent of a California, New York in other parts of the state of Florida, right? Nobody could argue that, let's say, St. John's County is the same as Miami-Dade County, or Manatee County is the same as Palm Beach County. They're just very different places. So this law is very clear to provide that the chief judge of any particular circuit can apply for a variance. Next bullet point. Um, so it only applies to felony arrests with regards to pretrial detention. And basically what it says is, if at the time of your arrest, any of the following things exist in your case, you cannot post bond without going in front of a judge. Now, let me back up for a second, because we have certain crimes on the books, even misdemeanors, misdemeanors, where you are not allowed to post bond until you go in front of a judge. The best example I can give you is a domestic violence case. If you get arrested for misdemeanor domestic battery or misdemeanor domestic assault, you will not be allowed to post your $500 or $1,000 bond or whatever it is until you are taken in front of a judge. You must go in front of a judge. Why must you go in front of a judge? Because in those cases, there's a mandatory stay away order that must be a condition of your bond, and you cannot be given a stay away order unless the judge actually tells you. So you can't post bond. This uniform bond schedule takes that same philosophy and adopts it to the following conditions. Number one, and I'm going to try and run through them quickly. Um, if you were out on felony bond for some other case while you picked up this new one, or if you were on probation or community control at the time of your arrest, you must be taken in front of a judge. This doesn't mean you don't get bond. It just means you can't post bond without going in front of a judge. Why? Because they want the judge who sets bond to know that you were either out on bond already or you were on probation or community control. And this way, we don't wind up reading in the newspaper what you see virtually every day in Colorado or in, uh, California or New York about people who are out on bond that murdered somebody or stabbed somebody or broke into a store, or did whatever the hell they did, carjacked. Here in Florida, we're not saying you don't get bond. We're just saying you don't get a pass until the judge gets to hear it because they may want to give you a different set of conditions of pretrial release, whether it's a higher bond, GPS, whatever, whatever. Go ahead, Ed. Or what happens is in the state of Florida, if you have a case already pending and you're out on bond and you pick up a new case, you are entitled to a bond in that new case, but the judge can now revoke your bond on the old case. Well, that was always the law. That was I, always the law. That is always the law. So why is it that they're saying that in this scenario, you have to be in front of a judge? Because otherwise, you would bond out on the new case. You'd be out on the street. And if the judge wanted to revoke your old bond case, they'd have to go and pick you up and arrest you and bring you to court. So now what they're saying is now it's up to the judge. You're going to have to see your judge. Not just for the new case, but mainly, I think, that aspect of it is for the old case. So the judge well, can decide what to do with it. And it's also because, again, just like we were talking about with that um, disabilities registry, the same thing applies here. A lot of times you get there are many people who get arrested in Florida that live in another county. Right. And so you can be on probation in Flagler County and get arrested in Dade and nobody knows any better. So they just bond you out. And it has happened. Uniform this uniform schedule addresses that. Let me let me get through the other things that 
that require you to go to a judge and prevent you from posting bond where you where before January 1st you could have done so. If at the time of your arrest you have previously been designated a sex offender or a sex predator, regardless of whether it's in Florida or any other state, if that's there, if you have that, that tag, that scarlet letter, you must go in front of a judge. If you are arrested for violating a protective injunction, so if somebody has a DVRO against you or a stalking injunction or a dating injunction or whatever, if you violate that injunction, it has always been an independent crime. Plus, you can Russ is back. We're, right, we're trying it outside of the car now, huh? Wow, man, that's crazy. I'm just going through the ex through the the pre mandatory bond appearance things, and then I'll chime you in again. Okay. So, if you violated a protective order, you could always be held in contempt. You could always be given a new charge. But now they're saying you cannot be released until you go in front of a judge. You must go in front of a judge. The judge needs to be aware that you violated that protective injunction. That's correct. Um, if you have uh, any time prior to this new arrest been designated as a prison release reoffender, habitual violent felony offender, three-time violent felony offender, or a violent career criminal, those are all enhancements um, which require now a mandatory appearance. It did not require an appearance, and this does not affect you if you have been designated as a habitual offender or even a habitual violent felony offender, because neither of those are included in this particular order. Here's another one that you see a lot in, in, in a lot of these progressive states that Florida has now addressed. Quote, the person has been arrested three or more times in the six months immediately preceding the current arrest. So if they have you on the books for three or more arrests in six months, you're not bonding until you go in front of a judge. We're not taking the chance that you get a fourth pass. And just so we're crystal clear for the audience, that, that means you could have gotten arrested three times, and all three times the case was dismissed. Doesn't matter. Now, on the fourth arrest, you're going to have to go in front of a judge. So, Any, as Russ said earlier, if it's a second-degree felony or above, and this is across the board, if it's a second-degree felony or above, you cannot post bond until you go in front of a judge. Third degree felonies, you still can, but second degree and above, you cannot. Again, you're not denied bond. You're just denied the ability to post bond without going in front of a judge for a bond hearing initial review. Um, here's another one that we have here uh, in uh, also any homicide should go without saying. But why is that important? Because prior to this year, prior to this new law, if you had a DUI manslaughter or a BUI manslaughter here in Miami-Dade County or anywhere in the state, but I know the bond in Miami was $15,000, post it and you're out immediately. Not anymore. Now you have to go in front of a judge. Um, here's one that's another one of these progressive state responses. If you are arrested for assault in furtherance of a riot or an aggravated riot, you must go in front of a judge. If it's a felony battery, domestic battery by strangulation, or any domestic violence, stalking, mob intimidation, assault or battery on a law enforcement officer, juvenile probation officer, staff or detention center, or a commitment facility, staff member of a commitment facility, or a health services provider, assault battery on anyone 65 years of old, age or older, any robbery, burglary, carjacking, or resisting arrest with, not without, but with violence. All of those require a mandatory appearance in front of a judge. You cannot be let out without going in front of a judge. This also applies to kidnapping, false imprisonment, human trafficking, human smuggling, possession of a firearm or ammunition by a felon, uh, sexual battery, indecent, lewd, lascivious touching, abuse, neglect, exploitation of elderly or disabled people, Child abuse, aggravated child abuse, arson, riot, aggravated riots, inciting a riot, aggravated inciting a riot, burglary or theft during a riot, escape, tampering or retaliating against a victim, witness or informant, destruction of evidence, tampering with a jury, um, trafficking in controlled substances, which also was a bondable offense. First degree felony, you were able to bond out here. Bond was always high, but if you had it, you could post it. Racketeering. Failure to appear warrants. If you get taken in and you have an FTA, you cannot bond out. Um, so all of those things are the delineated. 
Now, the standard bonds, for all of those people, you must go to a first appearance. And from that point on, the judge gets to make an individual determination based on all the factors that existed prior to January 1, none of which have changed. Which so is they, why, why you also may want to hire a lawyer to go in. because If you have to have a bond hearing, yes. At that point, absolutely. You can argue to reduce your bond if you can't afford it. The state can also argue to increase the bond. So you may want to have a lawyer in case they try to increase your bond. So it, it does give you more opportunities, just not the quick, opportunity that you could basically bond out within a couple hours after being arrested. So the standard bonds that they've set as, as minimums that can be used statewide now, again, providing that the chief judge of any circuit can apply for a variance and the court may or may not, Supreme Court may or may not grant it. But for third degree felonies, it's either 5,000 or 2,500. Remember, for second degree or up, there's no bottom line because you have to go to initial appearance but for third degree felonies you're still allowed to post bond in that in between period of time of arrest before initial appearance bond can be posted for third degree felonies at a minimum there's Russ again minimum statewide level of either 5,000 or 2,500 the higher is if there's any force or violence the lower is if there is no force or violence before we lose Russ Mike I want to ask a question Go ahead. Russ, did those numbers change on the standard bonds now? Or are they the same? They've Not for been? Miami. They're the same for Miami. Oh, God, we lost him again. He's, that's horrible. That's right, let me fix, let I'm me fix. Sure. I thought, I thought they'd stay. For us, they'd stay the same. For us, they're the same. But for other counties, remember, I told you for Broward, it used to be historically a $1,000 bond. Right. So, you know, I, I don't know the why of that. Um for first degree misdemeanors, it's the same thing. They bifurcated it between violent and nonviolent. Nonviolent, I, well, let's start with violent. It's a minimum of a thousand. Uh, nonviolent, it's five hundred. And the same thing with second degree misdemeanors. It's either two fifty or one fifty. Yep. So that's that's you know again, I look at this and say I don't understand how corrections could screw this up. An idiot could get this right. It is so plain and simple. It's, it's beyond me. And they have a legal department, by the way. And they've had plenty of time. This thing was, this thing was signed on December 12th of 2023 by the uh, clerk of court. So that's when the Supreme, it became effective, when the Supreme Court signed off on it. They had three weeks to figure this out. It is the laziness of the bureaucracy within corrections. Again, I want to be 100% crystal clear. Not the individual corrections officers. Many of them are just as frustrated as we are. I, we talk to them all the time, Michael. You know, we'll be in court. The court will give an order. We'll all have an order. Everybody will be on board. And thankfully, some of these individual corrections officers who are great, hardworking people who love their job and, and, and take it seriously will speak up sometimes, right, and say things like, oh, Your Honor, you can't do that. And then the judge, will, I can't remember specifics right now, but I know that every once in a while, we'll all look at him like he's got three heads. What is so complicated? And they'll be begrudgingly they'll have to tell us well the policy is that you can't do that really like no it's 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 maddening i mean and again i, I want to say this probably for the third or fourth time in 32 years i have met more individual corrections officers whom i respect whom i like i mean i people who i've taken into my home i've had barbecues with i've gone to their houses we've gone out for drinks i mean these are really just solid great people they treat us well when we go to the jails they're accommodating. I mean, look, every now and then you run into a douchebag, but the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them are just really solid people who are trying to help everybody out. They don't even want the problems. Middle, by the way, even the middle level management, the sergeants and the lieutenants, you know, I'll call over sometimes when something can't get done. I've had their cell phone numbers. They resolve it. We're talking the top level. That's where the problem is. At up I, high in the bureaucracy of the people that are, you know, uh, 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 dictating these policies that they're just lazy. They just don't want to read. That's, that's why um, we're where we're at. But so, so let me, let up. me just say real quick, um, for the, Russ, here. Russ, obviously, Russ obviously has had, you know, connectivity issues. He just texted me saying, I'm sorry, I'm killing myself trying to sign back in. It's not letting me log on and it won't let me remain on. So I don't I don't know what the reason is, but it's not for a lack of trying. As the audience can see, you know, he's logged in several times. 
Um, I, would have, I would have loved to have had Russ's take on this. Uh, but, you know, the reality is I can sum this up very quickly. Very little has changed. And the truth is what they did change, as far as I'm concerned, as a private citizen, not as a lawyer, but as a private citizen, I'm very happy with it. I don't, think, I don't think that uh, the strategy of just letting people revolve door through the system an uncountable number of times. I mean, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the subway uh, 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 manslaughter up in New York, Mr. Penny, the Marine. Remember that discussion? Yep. That guy was in and out of the system 37 or 40 times. And if the state of New York had some protocol, he wouldn't have been on the streets and he would not be dead right now. And Mr. Penny would not be facing a manslaughter charge. That is a fail by the system. And, and, and if, I, if I could say something quickly, I know we're, we've got to go, but basically what this new order from the Supreme Court says is this. If you're going to commit a violent crime in Florida or something that's considered a violent crime, you're not going anywhere until a judge can look at this and a prosecutor can look at this with their eyes and decide whether or not you actually should be allowed back in society. That's all. That's all. And, so, and again, by fine. the way, that has always been, that is the way the system has been designed in the state of Florida from the start. It's just what didn't always happen that way because many of these people were able to post bonds before Correct. they got in front of the judge. But if they couldn't post bond, none of the processes, none of the considerations, none of the factors, nothing has changed. It is identical to what it was in 2023 and earlier. It's the same. I agree. Well, with that said, let me let me again apologize on behalf of us and and by Russ for Russ. He really wanted to be a part of of, of helping us to talk about the bond issue. Uh, I suppose we can try and bring him back on another time when he's stationary. It's difficult, you know, from the road. He actually pulled over and and tried to do this from a stop. So uh, it wasn't for a lack of trying. But I look, folks, new laws, new rules. I'm just a bill schoolhouse rock. Uh, easy stuff. And and uh, I, I think some of these are really wonderful common sense things. It's nice as I look at it to see the legislature doing something that that doing things that are, uh, in my view, positive anyhow. And of course, I recognize that other people may have a different take. I respect it. I'm not, not here to argue with you. I'm happy to have any kind of civilized discussion. Uh, I will agree to disagree or I will agree to agree. Maybe you can change my mind. Um, but I'm. I'm certainly open-minded enough to, to talk like a civilized human being, provided we don't have a polarized, angry discussion. With that said, there will not be a show next week because Ed and I will be honoring the late, great uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate for us to have a show on that day, so we'll, we will delay it in honor of uh, the, the great pastor, uh, Reverend. And the following week, uh, the 22nd, we will have a show. We do have a guest coming on. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Michael Brannon, who has been a guest before, but this one's going to focus on Miranda rights. Uh, people have a million questions and misperceptions about Miranda. We will set the record straight from a legal point of view, but more importantly, Dr. Brannon will give us a forensic analysis as to how the defense or the state will try to either admit or, uh, or exclude confessions uh, based on, on an individual's capacity and ability to understand Miranda. And then the following week, the week after that, uh, we have a treat for the audience um, with respect to last night's tragic Miami Dolphins loss. We have a, a hero, a Miami Dolphins hero uh, and a judicial warrior, in fact, our own judge warrior, which I'll explain later, a warrior judge, Edward Newman will be joining us uh, for uh, episode number 84 of At Your Service on January 29th to talk about his career, his, his education, his career uh, as an NFL star and a 72 Miami undefeated Miami Dolphin, and then his 28-year career uh, on the bench as a judge here in Miami-Dade County. With those shows previewed, I want to thank everybody uh, for your attention and your time. Ed, thank you for coming on today. I apologize uh, to the audience, both for and on behalf of uh, Russ, who really wanted to be a part of this discussion, but we will bring him back another time, I promise. That said, thank you all very much. We appreciate your watching, and we look forward to uh, have a great Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd for episode number 83, where Ed and I will again be back at your service. All Thanks. Right. Oh, and as soon as the producers give us the link, we'll upload this to, to, to uh, social media.